Hello everyone, this is Ms. Romani. For this lesson, I would like to focus on two related topics, metabolism and energy. So let's start with metabolism. This is an image from the website of a biotech company called Roche. In it, they provide an interactive map of all the known chemical reactions in a cell. We call these chemical reactions metabolic pathways. And as you can see, there is a lot going on in this image. You can actually zoom in on any part of the map, like here, to get a more detailed view of the chemical reactions involved. The map is quite neat to explore. You can set filters and even search for specific molecules. It is free to use, so I have added a link to the website in case you want to explore the map yourself. In this course, we will be exploring a few of these metabolic pathways, but as you can see from this map, the chemistry in a cell can be quite complex. We call the sum of all the chemical reactions in an organism the metabolism of that organism. So like I said, reactions in an organism tend to be part of a metabolic pathway. That is a series of chemical reactions that happen in sequence so that the products of one reaction becomes a reactant in another or several other reactions. This image actually only shows you the first five out of ten reactions in glycolysis. And glycolysis is just the start of a longer metabolic pathway called cellular respiration, which we'll study in a lot more detail in this unit. Cellular respiration is actually a type of metabolic pathway called a catabolic pathway. Metabolism in a cell is made up of two types of metabolic pathways, those that build molecules and those that break them apart. Catabolic pathways break apart larger molecules into smaller ones and release energy in the process. Cellular respiration, for example, is a series of chemical reactions that result in the breakdown of glucose into carbon dioxide and water in order to release energy as ATP. On the other hand, anabolic pathways assemble complex or large molecules from smaller molecules and consumes energy in order to do this. An example of an anabolic pathway would be photosynthesis. Photosynthesis requires energy in the form of light and uses that energy in a series of reactions to make glucose from carbon dioxide and water. Other examples of catabolic reactions include the breakdown of fats, sugars, and proteins during digestion into its monomers, while anabolic reactions happen whenever our cells use those monomers to build our body parts. In cells, the energy needed for anabolic reactions is supplied by catabolic reactions. This is something called the coupling of reactions, and something we will explore in more detail at the end of this lesson. So let's now talk about energy in living things. Life requires energy. In order to stay alive, cells need to continuously use energy. For example, life requires order, and energy is needed to create that order. Molecules and organelles are organized into cells, cells into tissues, tissues into organs, and organs into organ systems that keep the organism alive. Organisms need to grow and reproduce, and both of those things require a lot of energy. And all living things need to be able to maintain a constant internal state, something called homeostasis, which we will explore in more detail in a later unit. But what happens when energy is no longer available, or is no longer able to be used by a cell? The answer is death. Death is what happens when a cell is no longer able to use energy. It just dies. So, since energy is obviously very important for life, let's explore energy a little bit further. So first we need to understand that energy exists in different forms. This candle, for example, is emitting energy as it burns. There is light and heat, two different forms of energy, but there's also chemical potential energy in the wax. The chemical bonds in the wax molecules contain energy, and it is that energy that is transformed and released as heat and light as the candle burns. In a similar way, this apple is full of chemical potential energy stored in the chemical bonds in the sugar that makes up the apple. When we eat the apple, we can transform that energy into other forms. And this concept of energy changing forms brings us to the laws of thermodynamics. There are two laws of thermodynamics we need to cover in this lesson. And the first law you're probably familiar with. It is the law of conservation of energy. In its most simple form, the first law of thermodynamics states that in a closed system, Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only change form. To illustrate that, let's take a look at this food chain. 
The first thing that we need to note is that all living things require a constant supply of energy. But since that energy cannot be created, it has to come from somewhere. And on Earth, the source of all energy is the sun. During photosynthesis, energy in sunlight is converted by the grass in this food chain into chemical potential energy that is stored in sugar molecules. When the grasshopper eats the sugar, it will use cellular respiration to convert some of that energy into the energy found in molecules of ATP. But there are other energy conversions happening. Each of these organisms will also change the energy in ATP into other forms that are needed to keep them alive, like for example the mechanical energy needed to open and close stomata in plants, or move muscles in animals, or for active transport in all of their cells. And throughout the whole system, whenever there is some sort of energy transformation, some energy is lost. It is never destroyed, because energy cannot be destroyed, but any loss of energy is released as heat or thermal energy. And there's another thing happening in this image besides the transfer of energy. The grasshopper here is eating the grass as a source of energy, but is also eating the grass as a source of nutrients that it will use to build its cells and body parts through a series of catabolic and anabolic pathways. The second law of thermodynamics has to do with something called entropy. Entropy is a term that refers to the amount of disorder in a system. The most simple way of stating the second law of thermodynamics is that the state of entropy of the entire universe, as an isolated system, will always increase over time. Or in other words, the entropy of the universe is always increasing. To help us illustrate the second law of thermodynamics, we can use the analogy of a teenager's bedroom. The picture on the left shows a room that is tidy and ordered. Everything is in its place. This room could be said to have low entropy. Now, if no energy or work is put into keeping the room tidy, over time, the room becomes messy and starts to look like the image on the right. This bedroom on the right is disordered and has a high level of entropy. So the natural tendency is for the room over time to start looking more and more like the picture on the right. The entropy in this closed system will naturally increase over time. But your room doesn't have to stay messy. You can indeed lower the entropy of your room by cleaning it. But to do that, it will require work. And so that means that we have to put energy into the system in the form of cleaning up and putting everything away. Let's take a look at another example. In this video clip, you see what happens when drops of ink are added to a cup of water. The ink naturally diffuses throughout the cup. When the ink is in the dropper and the molecules of ink are close together, the entropy is low. When the ink is diffusing in the cup of water, the molecules are now farther apart and more disordered, so the entropy is higher. If I reverse the clip, we can see the opposite. The ink is now going from a state of high entropy to one of lower entropy. But of course that doesn't make sense. The tendency in the universe will always be towards higher entropy. But what about living things? Living things are highly ordered. We make large molecules from smaller nutrients and organize those macromolecules into cells and tissues and into body parts. We build nests and homes. What living things do is to use energy to create ordered structures from less ordered materials. Living things decrease entropy. But then what about the second law of thermodynamics, the one that says that the entropy of the universe is always increasing? Don't living things violate that? And the answer is no. Because as living things take in energy and transform that energy through chemical reactions to do the work that is needed to maintain order, they lose some amount of usable energy in the process. Because no reaction is completely efficient, that energy is often lost as heat, and heat released into the environment increases the entropy of the surrounding air. Living things also produce waste and byproducts that aren't useful energy sources. So this process again increases the entropy of the surroundings. So even though living things are highly ordered and maintain a state of low entropy, the entropy of the universe in total is constantly increasing. Essentially, living things are in a continuous uphill battle against this constant increase in universal entropy. 
And now that we've talked about energy, I'd like to focus on Gibbs free energy. In thermodynamics, Gibbs free energy is used to determine the energy in a system that can do useful work. We use this equation to calculate the change in free energy, which will let us know if the reaction will be spontaneous or not. First of all, for this course, you will not be required to do any mathematical calculations using this equation. But you do need to be familiar with it. So let's take a look at the variables in this equation. Delta H refers to the change in total energy, whether or not the reaction is exothermic and therefore gives off energy, or endothermic and absorbs energy from its surroundings. A change in entropy is delta S. That's the measure of order or disorder, with a negative delta S meaning the system becomes more ordered, and a positive delta S meaning that the system becomes more disordered. And T is temperature, which is measured in Kelvin, and Kelvin is always a positive value. So there is no negative temperatures, only positive temperature values. So if you don't need to make calculations, what is it that you need to know about this equation? Mostly you will be asked to predict whether or not a reaction or process will be spontaneous or not based on its delta G or change in free energy. When the change in free energy or delta G of a process is negative, we call that an exergonic process or an exergonic reaction. Exergonic reactions proceed spontaneously. What that means is that it will continue on its own without any input of energy. Let's look at the example of a burning fire. Once the fire has started, once it has been ignited, will the combustion reaction that produced the fire continue without a constant input of energy? Think about it. Like all chemical reactions, to keep the fire going, it needs a constant supply of reactants. So in this case, let's say the wood that is burning and the oxygen in the air that is feeding the combustion. But does it need a constant input of energy? Well, no. It does not. A burning fire will continue to burn as long as there's enough reactants. We don't need to continuously add energy to keep the fire going. So a burning fire is spontaneous. It has a negative delta G. It is exergonic. Let's see how that relates to the Gibbs free energy equation. First, let's look at the change in total energy. Fire is an exothermic reaction. It gives off energy to the environment and therefore has a negative delta H. So what about entropy? A fire is always going to have a positive change in entropy. It's going to increase disorder, so the delta S is positive. Since temperature is in Kelvin and it's always positive, in this equation we have a negative value subtracted by a positive value. This will result in a delta G that is negative. So a combustion reaction, like in a fire, will have a delta G that is negative. That means that it's exergonic and spontaneous at all temperatures. Now let's take a look at a non-spontaneous process. When the change in free energy or delta G of a process is positive, it is called endergonic. Endergonic reactions are non-spontaneous, meaning that they need a constant supply of energy to be added in order to continue in the forward direction. So let's take a look at the example of photosynthesis and see how it relates to the Gibbs free energy equation. And again, let's first look at the change in total energy, or delta H. Photosynthesis happens to be an endothermic reaction. It absorbs energy from the environment in the form of light. And if that light energy stops, photosynthesis stops. So it has a positive delta H. And since photosynthesis makes larger molecules from many smaller ones, it makes glucose from carbon dioxide and water, the process creates more order and is decreasing entropy. So the delta S is negative. And so looking at the equation, we have a positive value minus a negative value. And so that would result in a delta G that is positive, And that is true regardless of the temperature. Now there are some situations where temperature makes a difference. Here's a chart that can help predict the spontaneity of our reaction. We already saw that fire is spontaneous at all temperatures and that photosynthesis is non-spontaneous at all temperatures. But what about a process that is only spontaneous at higher temperatures? An example of that is melting ice. 
The process of melting ice has a positive delta H because it absorbs energy from its surroundings. And because ice is more ordered than liquid water, it increases entropy and has a positive delta S. So this process would only be spontaneous and have a negative delta G when the value of delta S times the temperature is higher than the delta H, so only at higher temperatures. The opposite is true of water freezing into ice. In this case, the process is only spontaneous at lower temperatures. So, to summarize, if the change in free energy or delta G of a reaction or process is negative, then the reaction will be exergonic and spontaneous and will continue in the forward direction towards the products without a constant input of energy. If the change in free energy or delta G of a reaction is positive, then the reaction will be endergonic and non-spontaneous, meaning that it will not continue in the forward direction without a constant input of energy. It will, however, be spontaneous in the opposite direction. If the change in free energy, on the other hand, is zero, then the reaction or process will be at equilibrium and will proceed equally forwards and backwards. So what is the connection now between Gibbs free energy and biology? To make that connection, let's actually look at cellular respiration. Cellular respiration, just like the burning fire in the previous example, is just a combustion reaction. So it is an exergonic reaction. It has a negative delta G. More specifically, it has a delta G value of negative 2,882 kilojoules per mole. What that means is that if you have one mole of glucose, it will release that much energy. Originally, that energy is stored as chemical potential energy in the bonds of glucose. And how that energy is then released will be actually discussed in more detail in the next few lessons. But for now, let's take a look at this reaction in an energy diagram. This diagram is showing us the free energy of the molecules over time as the reaction progresses. The free energy in the bonds of the reactants is much higher than the free energy in the bonds of the products. Now you may recall from your chemistry classes that this part of the graph right here is called the activation energy. That energy is needed to get the reaction started. The activation energy is needed to loosen the bonds and the reactants. As the bonds are breaking and new bonds are forming, when the molecules are at their highest energy, it is called the transition state. If you think about it, the activation energy makes sense. If you had a bunch of glucose, say in a marshmallow, you would have to provide it with some energy before it can combust. It won't just catch fire on its own. So let's say you stick the marshmallow on the end of a stick and you put that stick inside a campfire and it is that fire that is going to provide the activation energy needed to get the reaction going to start the combustion of that glucose. But once the marshmallow catches fire, it will continue to burn on its own. You can remove it completely from the campfire and it will continue to burn until all the reactants are gone. Now in the process, the difference in free energy between the reactants and products is released by the reaction. For this course, you will need to be able to recognize an exergonic or an endergonic reaction from their energy graphs. The easiest way to do this is to look at the energy of the reactants versus the products. In exergonic reactions, the reactants have more free energy than the products. And in an endergonic reaction, the reactants have less free energy than the products. Now notice that both endergonic and exergonic reactions require some activation energy. In the example that I gave you before of the burning marshmallow, that activation energy came from a campfire. Obviously, a fire is not a way by which living cells can acquire the activation energy that is needed for all chemical reactions. So what can cells do? What cells do is they use enzymes to significantly lower the activation energy of a chemical reaction. Enzymes will help lower the energy required to achieve the transition state. What enzymes do not do is change the overall free energy of a reaction. And since every chemical reaction we will look at in the next few lessons will be aided or catalyzed by an enzyme, it's important that you understand. Not only that, but in the next few lessons you will also see that metabolic processes do not occur in a single step, but rather in a series of reactions. 
so the energy diagram for cellular respiration looks a little bit more like this with many many steps to get from the reactants to the products and about 60 percent of the free energy released in this reaction is released as heat or thermal energy most of which is used to keep our body at a constant temperature and the rest is released and stored as molecules of ATP. So we call this process controlled oxidation. However, the rapid combustion of glucose, like in the marshmallow example, looks like this, with a rather large activation energy. Overall, the same amount of energy is released, but in this case, it is all released as heat and light. Okay, now, so there is one more thing I would like to teach you about free energy in living cells before we finish with this lesson, and that is the concept of reaction coupling. In living cells, endergonic reactions can obtain the free energy that they require by a process called energy coupling. All it means is that an endergonic reaction is coupled or paired up with an exergonic reaction. The endergonic reaction requires energy to proceed, but the exergonic reaction releases energy. So if the exergonic reaction releases more free energy than is required by the endergonic reaction, then the endergonic reaction can proceed. In this example, the reaction of A that produces the products B and C is exergonic because it has a negative delta G. The reaction releases 5 kilojoules per mole of free energy. Meanwhile, the reaction that forms F from reactants D and E is endergonic and requires 4 kilojoules per mole of energy. So when the reactions are coupled, the difference is still a negative delta G of negative 1 kilojoules per mole. So the two reactions together are spontaneous and can proceed. Energy coupling is what allows ATP to provide free energy for cellular reactions. The hydrolysis of ATP into ADP in a free phosphate group is an exergonic reaction that can be coupled to endergonic reactions within cells. You will learn more about ATP hydrolysis and the formation of ATP in your next lessons. And that's it. I know that we've covered a lot of chemistry, physics, and biology in this lesson. The aim of this lesson is to make sure that you have a proper foundation to understanding the metabolic processes involved in cellular respiration and photosynthesis, which is the focus of this unit. So take care, and I will talk to you soon.